the topic of this video segment is on electrons, energy levels, and orbitals, terms that I will define as we go through this material. This information is found in section 4.6 of your textbook. As an introduction, as a framework to put this information in, I start out by telling you that chemical reactions, all of them, are caused by movement of electrons within an atom or atoms, molecules, or ionic compounds. And I've abbreviated compounds with something you'll see me use a lot throughout this semester, CPDS, my abbreviation for compounds. So chemical reactions are caused by electron movement. Therefore, in order to understand why chemical reactions are occurring, we need to understand how electrons are, are arranged, and another word for that is configured. How electrons are arranged or configured around a nucleus. And when we have a better understanding of how they're arranged, then we can come to a, a deeper understanding of why it is that they are moving the way that they are, causing chemical reactions to occur. Now before I discuss important facts from section 4.6, I first want to point out to you, you should have your textbook open and you should be looking at figure 4.9, which begins section 4.6. Figure 4.9 is a diagram of the electromagnetic spectrum. In other words, this energy spectrum consisting of visible light and other forms of light. And all energy is characterized by wave-like movement. And you see that diagrammed in figure 4.9. So energy is moving in wave-like motion, continuous, not localized, not discrete, the way we imagine and understand matter to be. So wave-like behavior, continuous, characterized by having a frequency and a wavelength. A wavelength, distance between consecutive points on a wave, frequency, how many wavelengths can pass through a point in a given period of time. And you see that figure 4.9 says that the shorter the wavelength and the higher the frequency of the wave, the greater its energy. So gamma radiation is on one end of this spectrum. We know gamma radiation to be very high energy radiation because its waves are characterized by such a small wavelength, therefore such a high frequency. Gamma radiation is very dangerous for living organisms to be in, uh, exposed to, to, to at all. To any degree, we'd need protection from that. The other end of the electromagnetic spectrum you see is characterized by radio waves, very long wavelength types of radiation with low energy associated with them, right? Long wavelength, large wavelength, small frequency, low energy. So the higher the frequency, the higher the energy, the lower the frequency, the lower the energy. Now, why am I talking about electromagnetic spectrum and energy? Because shifting our attention to electrons, it turns out that electrons exhibit behavior like both particles, discrete, bundled, localized, and like waves, continuous, moving with a frequency and a wavelength. And that concept is fundamental and powerful and came to with a, we discovered this with a great deal of work and effort, trying to shift our thinking to understand what electrons are truly like. This model that I'm describing to you is known as the quantum mechanical model of the atom. It's our current working model of the atom. And I'm trying to just summarize some key aspects of it very quickly and fairly simply here. So, electrons exhibit behavior like both particles 
and waves. Why is that important? Because if an electron is wave-like in its behavior, then that means we cannot know the exact location of an electron around the nucleus. Scientists once thought they could figure that out, and now they know they can't. How do you pinpoint the exact location of a wave? So we cannot know the exact location of an electron, but we do know, point number two, that electrons move in distinct, separate, three-dimensional regions of space around the nucleus. And we call these regions energy levels, and I'm abbreviating energy levels here EL. So if you see that abbreviation on the board later, I'm talking about energy levels. And scientists have agreed to use the symbol lowercase n to refer to energy levels. Notice that the size, the distance from the nucleus, and the energy all increase as the energy level number increases. So size, distance from nucleus, and energy all increase as the energy level number increases. And I've given you a drawing here, fairly simple, to try to help explain that. Right here at the center of this drawing is a little red dot with a plus sign, and this refers to the nucleus. And we know that is where the protons and the neutrons are located. Where are the electrons found? Well, we don't know their precise location, but we know they are found in energy levels surrounding the nucleus. Now you've seen that I've drawn these circles. I want you to imagine them as a three-dimensional volume. So don't think of this like a track, a flat two-dimensional area. Think of it like a three-dimensional region of space. So the first energy level, I'm symbolizing by n equals 1, is the smallest volume closest to the nucleus. So when an electron is in the first energy level, it's experiencing its greatest attraction to positive charge. Remember, that's what negative charge wants. It wants to be near positive charge, speaking in human terms for what we know as electrostatic forces of attraction. So when an electron is in the first energy level, it is closest to the nucleus, most stable, and in its lower, lowest energy state. As an electron moves to higher energy levels, and why would it have to move? Well, it would have to move if the first energy level is occupied and there's no room for it, or it could move if you give it energy, if it absorbs energy and becomes an excited electron. So as an electron occupies energy levels that are bigger in size, the electron is spending more of its time farther away from the nucleus and has to be in a higher energy state to overcome that nuclear attraction. So as energy levels increase in size, and I've drawn here n equals 1, n equals 2, n equals 3, and you need to, in your mind, imagine these energy levels nested one inside of the other, sort of like Russian dolls. Where, which are beautifully painted wooden dolls. And if you look at it, it's in two pieces. And if you take those two pieces apart, there's an identical doll, smaller in size, nested in it. Take that apart, a smaller doll nested inside of that, all identical. So the idea here, I'm wanting to capture the nested, the placed one inside of the other. So energy levels are nested inside of each other. Suppose I have an electron in this very first energy level, n equals one closest to the nucleus. It's in its most stable state, which we refer to as ground state. Lowest energy, greatest stability. Well, if that electron absorbs energy in the form of heat or light, 
it now has sufficient energy to move to a higher energy level farther away from the nucleus. So if it's in an N equals 3 energy level, right, it's more energetic than in its previous N equals 1 state. And we call this electron an excited electron because it absorbed energy to make that jump. But the nucleus with that positive charge is still pulling on this negatively charged electron to return back to that lower energy, N equals one energy level. But in order to return, it must release the energy that it absorbed. And it can do it in, a, in several different ways. It can maybe jump from N equals one, or excuse me, N equals three to N equals two, a smaller jump and give off energy with a longer wavelength and lower frequency, in other words, less energy release if it does a smaller jump, say from n equals 3 to n equals 2 energy level. Or it can return back to ground state jumping from n equals 3 to n equals 1. And that's a bigger energy gap, therefore a more energetic light. And I'm trying to draw here light that is released as the electrons move from various energy, one energy level to another. And they can do that in various ways. If you've ever enjoyed a fireworks display, the light that is being given off is exactly what I'm drawing here. You're seeing electron shifts happen within atoms, and whenever light is released, an electron has moved from one energy level to another, or from one orbital to another, which we haven't talked about yet, releasing energy in the form of light. So, as the energy level number increases, the size of the energy level is increasing, and the energy of that energy level is increasing. Notice I've only drawn three energy levels here, but there are more than that. Space was just limited, so there's n equals 4, n equals 5, again increasing in size with these first three energy levels nested within it. All right, so we've discussed point 1, we've discussed point 2, and now I want to shift to point 3. Within each energy level are three-dimensional regions of space with unique shapes called orbitals. That's how I will refer to them. Your textbook can refer to them either as orbitals or sublevels. These orbitals are, or sublevels are regions of space where an electron is most probably located. Remember, we don't know exactly where they are, so we speak of probability regions within energy levels where they are most likely found. These regions are called orbitals, and they have specific unique shapes that you need to be familiar with. The first of these regions, first orbital I'd like to talk about is the S orbital. And if you take a look at figure 4.12 found in section 4.6, you'll see S orbitals drawn for you. Please notice that all S orbitals have a spherical shape. In other words, the drawings that I am showing here, you should not look at as tracks, like an orbit, but a three-dimensional region of space. That's why I've tried to shade them like an orange or a ball, right? So S orbitals, spherical shape, and notice this is important. There is only one S orbital in each energy level, no more than one and you find S orbitals beginning with the first energy level. So what I've drawn here for you is the 1S orbital, the 2S orbital, and the 3S orbital. Notice all these S orbitals are spherically shaped. The only difference is the size of the S orbital 
and that correlates directly with our understanding of size of energy levels. The 1s orbital is the s orbital found in the first energy level, which is smallest in size. So the 1s orbital is smaller in size than the 2s orbital, which is the s orbital in the second energy level. Because the 1s orbital is smaller in size, the electron is more likely to be closer to the nucleus, and it is a lower energy orbital than the 2s orbital, which in turn is smaller in size than the 3s orbital, s orbital in the third energy level. So an electron in a 2s orbital would be in a lower energy state than an electron in a 3s orbital. And once again, these arrows are indicating that the s orbitals are nested inside of each other. The 1s nested inside of the 2s, and the 1s and 2s nested inside of the 3s. So increasing size of s orbitals as you move to an increasing energy level. Increasing size and increasing energy of these orbitals and an electron if it's in that orbital, right? So once we've looked at the s orbitals, we now want to take a look at another type of orbital known as the p orbitals. And these are illustrated in figure 4.13. Notice that the shape changes when we move to the p orbital. Each of these different orbitals have their own unique shape. The p orbitals are dumbbell shaped and you always find them in a set of three. S orbitals, only one S orbital per energy level, but P orbitals always come in a set of three beginning with the second energy level. The first energy level is too small in size to have P orbitals. So you have to go to the second energy level before you have enough space to incorporate the p orbitals. They always come in a set of three. I've given you their drawings, and this is my attempt to explain this kind of two-lobed structure here, oriented along the x, y, z axes. That's what differentiates these p orbitals from each other. So I've drawn you the x-axis, the y-axis, and the z-axis, of course, we know is perpendicular to the x and y axes coming straight out from the board. Right at the center, the origin where these axes meet would be the nucleus with its positive charge. So notice I've drawn a p orbital with those two lobes piercing the x axis. This is the 2px orbital. p orbital, second energy level oriented along the x axis. Here is the 2py orbital, two-lobed, dumbbell shape, oriented along the y-axis found in the second energy level. And lastly, the 2pz orbital. And I'm trying to draw with this dotted line, three-dimensional representation of this z-axis coming right out of the board perpendicular to the x and y axes the 2pz orbital is oriented right along that lobe. So p orbitals, always three per energy level, beginning with the second energy level. The third type of orbital I'd like to mention is the d orbital. This is shown in figure 4.14, so see that figure to get a better idea of what we're trying to draw here. My space is limited, so I am not able to draw all of the d orbitals. I'm telling you that there are five of them. Five in an energy level beginning with n equals three. So every energy level starting with the third energy level and up, fourth energy level, fifth energy level, all of them have d orbitals and they always come in a set of five. Shape is getting more complicated as we move to these uh, more complex orbitals. 
four of the D orbitals are clover shaped and one of the five is dumbbell shaped with a ring around it. So it looks like a P orbital with a donut ring around it. Because the clover leaf shaped are the more abundant, I am giving you one example of a D orbital and you can see figure 414 and see the other ones as well. So notice it's a four leaf clover shaped and this particular D orbital, which is named 3D X squared minus Y squared, you do not have to know that, clearly more complicated, is a four leaf lobe. The lobes are piercing the X axis and the Y axis. And you can see the other remaining drawings of D orbitals shown in figure 414. There's one other type of orbital that we'll be talking about, but it's not shown in the textbook. It's a very complex shape. These are the F orbitals, and there are always seven F orbitals per energy level, beginning with the fourth energy level and up.